Welcome to the Factory Futurist Podcast, where we profile the thought leaders, technologies, and companies revolutionizing high-tech manufacturing. We learn from the best about how they sustain high-performance leadership in technology, their personal life, and their companies. If you're just joining the podcast, my name is Drew Allen. I'm the host, and when I'm not chatting with these fine folks, I'm the VP of Strategic Development at Grace Technologies. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Today on the Factory Futurist, we have Dr. Gleb Trupisky. He's known as the disaster avoidance expert. He has over 20 years of experience dramatically empowering leaders and organizations to avoid business disasters by addressing potential threats, maximizing unexpected opportunities, and resolving persistent personnel problems. He is best known for his national bestsellers on avoiding disasters in business and other life areas, The Truth Seekers Handbook, A Science-Based Guide, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and avoid business disasters, as well as his newest book, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. His cutting edge thought leadership has been featured in over 400 articles, and he's given over 350 interviews in popular venues that include Fast Company, CBS News, Time, Scientific American, Psychology Today, The Conversation, Business Insider, Government Executive, Inc. Magazine, and many others. His experience comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, speaking, and training mid-size and large businesses and nonprofits. He serves as CEO of the boutique consulting, coaching, and training firm, Disaster Avoidance Experts, which uses a proprietary methodology based on cutting edge research to help clients maximize their bottom line. His clients include Aflac, Balance Employment Assistance Provider, Edison Welding Institute, Fifth Third Bank, Honda, IBM, International Coaches Federation, Ohio Hospitals Association, and many more. He also has a strong research and teaching background in behavioral economics and neuroscience with over 15 years in academia with dozens of peer-reviewed academic publications under his belt. He earned his PhD in the history of behavioral science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2011, got his master's at Harvard in 2004, and his BA from NYU in 2002. He lives in Columbus, Ohio, and in his free time, he enjoys tennis, hiking, and playing with his cats. And most importantly, he makes sure to spend abundant quality time with his wife to avoid disasters in his personal life. We get into a lot of stuff. His comments were thought-provoking. They have me looking at certain aspects of our business. I really am so excited to have him on. I think you're gonna be able to glean a lot. This coronavirus pandemic is far from over, so if you haven't already acted, now is the time to take this advice to heart. So please join me with welcoming him on The Factory Futurist. Well, I am so happy to have you on. Um, today on Factory Futurist, we have Dr. Gleb. Uh, thank you so much for, for jumping on with us today. Thank you for inviting me, Drew. It's a pleasure. Well, you have got one of the most interesting apropos uh, backgrounds um, currently. Um, it does seem like we're a bit out of maybe the initial worst part of this situation. Um, so are people now kind of having some false hopes or are they, is the vigilance uh, dropping or what are you seeing uh, or what do you feel currently? I'd say yes to both. <laughs> people are having very much false hopes and vigilance is dropping and that's very unfortunate. So I'm having to, when I'm working with, my manufacturing clients, let's say, many of them want to get back to normal. <laughs> and that is a bad idea because right now we're in a period where states are loosening restrictions quite a bit before the federal White House guidelines are suggesting they should be loosening restrictions when cases are not dropping, when they're staying steady or actually still going up. So we're seeing a lot of problems that are going to be happening, that are increasingly going to be happening. I can make a very clear prediction that what's going to be happening is an uptick in cases in states that are opening up. And then there will be what so what will happen after an uptick of cases. There will be eventually a time period when they'll have restrictions again, because otherwise hospital systems will get overwhelmed. So here's the problem with COVID-19. Now we know that the death rate from COVID-19 is something like 0.5 at the lowest bound to 1% at the higher bound, somewhere in that range. 
The challenge with COVID-19 is that it's not simply that people get died, it's that people go to the hospital. So with people going to the hospital, hospitalization rate from people who are sick, and this includes people who are asymptomatic. So we know that about maybe 50% of the people who get sick with COVID-19 don't show symptoms. Of the rest, people who show symptoms, maybe something like overall, the a total of five to 10%. So. 10 to 20 percent of those who show symptoms or 5 to 10 percent of those overall who are asymptomatic and not asymptomatic have to go to the hospital to get treatment. So they get not simply seriously ill, but that ill enough that they, if they don't go to the hospital, they'll die. So that's the problem. Now, if you because COVID-19 is so infectious, it spreads very quickly. The challenge is that the hospital systems can become quickly overwhelmed if you don't have if you don't have restrictions. And that's what happened in northern Italy. That's what happened in New York City, where you had body bags carried out of hospitals into refrigerated trucks because the mortuaries were overwhelmed. That will not be tolerable for any city, for any entity, for any state. So regardless of how you feel, whether that's the right thing or not, there will be restrictions. There will be closing down because they, they, it will not be tolerable to have a fatality rate go from 0.5 to 1%, which is with good hospital treatment, to 5 to 10%, which is without, has a, without good hospital treatment when people when hospitals are overwhelmed. So the problem is that when it's reaching that stage in several months, there will be restrictions once again, and people aren't prepared for it. Markets aren't prepared for it. Manufacturing isn't prepared for it. Businesses aren't prepared for it. This is a big problem, that they're not looking forward to the future. Sure. They're trying to get back to normal, and they're thinking we're back to normal, and we're not. It also does not seem like the stock market has that priced in. <laughs> I, I just, I do not. No, the stock market does not have that priced in. No, believe me, I have the stock market shorted right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, I just do not understand. I, I, I just, I, I do not understand where the stock market is head at is at is at. I mean, what do you, I, I mean, I, I know obviously you're not an epidemiologist um, or um, a medical doctor, but do you think that there, is, I, I have very low hopes for a virus, or sorry, for a vaccine. Um, however, it does seem like there's going to be treatments um, mm -hmm. and, and there seems to be promising uh, potential in the treatments, um, but obviously they most of the time require hospital beds. Uh, do you have hope for uh, treatments so that this is not such a scary thing or people don't feel like this is a death sentence when they get it? Well, let's talk about, so we can talk about the stock market in a little bit, but let's talk about the health, the nature of the virus, the implications. So let's talk about the vaccines first and treatment just so we're on, get on the same page. Vaccines, realistically speaking, what the health experts are saying is that the earliest stage which, where we can actually have vaccines realistically is sometime in you know, early to mid 2021, that's when we can have vaccine approved. So approval of vaccine for production, for mass production. Now, that's very optimistic. That's super optimistic. You know, if everything goes right, if everything lines up, you know, everything is perfect. Like how, how often does everything happen perfectly, right? But let's say, you know, if it happens perfectly, then what will happen? I also understand that the, this requires a completely different new approach to vaccine development so that you yes. don't get a similar mm -hmm. issue like the RSV vaccine that they did in the 60s where there was actually increased mortality because what's killing people is actually an overactive immune response, not a lack of immune response. Correct? You're absolutely right. Yep. So that, and that's one of the things that they have to, that's why the trials take so long to go through and actually test the effectiveness, not simply the effectiveness, but also the safety of the vaccine. So that's why it will take until that long for if the first, you know, Moderna, let's say the vaccine works, you know, that's going to be how long it will take early to mid 2021. Now, then that it will have to be produced and for it to be produced, you know, how much resources does that take? So produced, distributed, people are vaccinated. You have to fight the anti-vaxxers that will take in the if you assume excellent government competence, which will, of course, have to produce this and distribute things. It will take at least six months for the vulnerable categories who are people over 60 and people with immune deficiency conditions and other deficiency conditions to be vaccinated. So right now, 
into vac mass vaccination of at least the most vulnerable by the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. Most people are not pricing that in. You know, that's the most optimistic scenario, and they're completely not pricing that in, that we'll have waves of restrictions and loosenings. Right now, what people are thinking about and feeling, the vast majority of the people who are thinking about this, business owners, business leaders, they think that the restrictions are over, that the, there will be no more restrictions and everything will go forward. That's how they're approaching things. I'm not an immunologist, epidemiologist. I'm a risk management expert, decision-making expert. And uh, you know, immunologists don't know how businesses leaders make decisions and what kind of risk management approach they take. The stock market is following the wisdom of people, let's say, uh, the, uh, like uh, Elon Musk, right? So he's pushing for factories to be opened. And uh, he said that on March 6th, that the coronavirus pandemic is the panic is dumb. And he said that in, when was it? in a tweet on March 20th, that we will have no more new cases in the US by the end of April. So that's the kind of people that the stock market is listening to. He drives prices. Goldman Sachs, you know, they drive prices. They made a prediction in February 24th. Their analysts predicted that the US fourth, uh, second quarter growth would be 2.7%. Then on March 15th, they lowered their prediction from growth of 2.7% to a decline of 5%. Then on March 20th, they said that no, now there will be a decline of 24% for second quarter GDP. So those are, they are very optimistic and they had to revise their estimates a lot. We, there is extensive optimism in the stock market. People in this, the stock market is not really prepared to deal with the, with a pandemic. It, it's never dealt with a pandemic before. And it's very optimistic. They approach the pandemic very optimistically. Then there are certain decision-making errors that they uh, that come from how our brain is wired that they cause them to approach the pandemic as optimistically. Now, you might be thinking, uh, you said about the treatment also, the remdesivir or other drugs. Well, it will take a very long time. Now, remdesivir, it seems, has effectiveness in lowering hospital stays. So people who would otherwise spend 15 days in the hospital, on average, spend maybe 11 days if they take remdesivir early enough. But it would take a very long time to first get approval of it, testing and so on, and then approval of it and mass production. So it would not really be widely available until the summer of 2021 in terms of approval mass production. So that's not really a silver bullet either. And even if it becomes widely available, it's not that impactful to decrease people's hospital stays. It's not like it decreases infection rates. So this is a big problem for us. This is not something treatment. We don't have treatments available. We don't have you know, treatments available soon. That's a big problem. And the most optimistic case for a vaccine is going to be sometime by the end of 2021, early 2022 mass vaccination, more realistically going into 2023, 2024, if everything doesn't line up perfectly. What so that's what we're dealing with. What's your take on the most recent science on immunity to this thing? I, 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 I've been trying to keep up with the science so sure. far as people's, whether or not you actually do get immunity by actually having COVID. I, I read one number that it seemed like it was only 10% of people who actually had it or immune to it moving forward. I, what, what are you, what, there was a few things over the weekend that seemed to contradict that information. What's your read on the immunity piece? So currently in mid-May, what we're seeing is that some people who are getting COVID-19, who got COVID-19 seem to be getting reinfected with it at a later stage. So that's worrisome in terms of immunity. Now, there's no clarity about why that's happening. It might be that certain people just fail to develop the antibodies needed and most people would be immune. The optimistic interpretation would be that, hey, you know, most people are immune after they get COVID-19 and only a small proportion of people are not immune. That's optimistic. The more pessimistic interpretation would be that, well, immunity fades pretty quickly within you know, the next several months. That's the more pessimistic interpretation. And we just haven't had the time to evaluate this question thoroughly. It's, it's a relatively new disease. So we really don't know enough to say which of these scenarios it is. 
and obviously it would be pretty bad if immunity fades quickly because then you know you have to get a vaccine every three months every five months that's that's not great so take, that that would be a serious problem so the going back to the decision making process i want to highlight this the market is not making good decisions around the pandemic simply because it doesn't have experience with pandemics and we as human beings don't make good decisions around major slow moving train wrecks like the pandemic. This is not something that we make good decisions around. So looking into the decision making risk management aspects of it, I've spent 15 years researching the cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics of this as a professor, including at Ohio State University and elsewhere, looking at how we as human beings make decisions. And we make very bad decisions around things that we don't have experience with, around things that aren't in the moment threats. The problem is, how we are wired. Our brain is wired to make decisions in response to threats, not with our gut reactions. When we go with our gut reactions, which is how most people make decisions, we go with something that's built for the savannah environment. Our gut reactions, our intuitions are built for the savannah environment. That's how we're wired. We're not built for the modern environment. The modern environment has been around really only since World War II. So we haven't had time to adapt to it, to evolve for it. Our intuitions are responding in a, in a savannah-like environment when we're hunters and gatherers living in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people. Our primary threat response is the fighter flight response when we have to jump at 100 shadows to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger you, know, you might have heard of this as a saber-toothed tiger response it's great for those intense immediate in the moment threats that are hunter and gatherer ancestors face that's wonderful <laughs> but unfortunately there are many less saber-toothed tigers nowadays so we still respond with that saber-toothed tiger response to major slow moving train wrecks like the coronavirus pandemic, which is that's a very bad response. And we don't think about the long term implications. That's so called yeah, go ahead. We, how, as a business leader, how do we shift that mindset away from mm -hmm. not following the, uh, the gut reaction? What you want to do is orient toward the long term and math out the reality of the situation. That's the so mathing, of course, bad business leaders are quite familiar with math numbers, looking at the facts, but they're not very good at orienting toward the long term and counting out what are the actual implications for the hit on your revenue, for the hit on your profitability, what's going to go on in the long term. So what you want to do is think about Here's what I work with on my clients, what I've been working on a lot with my clients and helping them figure out. Think about five years from now and make an optimistic scenario, a moderate scenario and a pessimistic scenario for vaccine development. Each of those might happen or not. So the optimistic scenario would be where everyone who is at least vulnerable is vaccinated by early 2022. That's the most optimistic scenario we can realistically orient toward. Then a moderate scenario would be everyone is vaccinated by 2024 who is vulnerable. And then pessimistic scenario vaccinated by 2027. And you know what, that might sound too very pessimistic to you, but we still don't have a vaccine against the flu. And we've been trying to get a flu vaccine for over a century. So the COVID-19, that's not that dissimilar from the flu. There are many dissimilarities, but some, some similarities as well. So that's that's a big problem. So what but you yeah, want to do- Personal flu vaccine. Do not have any universal influenza vaccine. <laughs> yep, uh, well, our influenza vaccine, unfortunately, is only 50% effective. So it's 50% effective in reducing infections. That's not great, but that might be something that we might get a vaccine that's only 50% effective against COVID-19. It's possible. Or it might not. Yeah, we also or I mean, I, I, what people tell me about this herd immunity thing, you know, and I, I'm not a proponent of it because I, I don't think there's a science in on the immunity piece. But I go, yeah, we don't try to get herd immunity, herd immunity to eight. You know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right. I, I think exactly. More, more yep, in the, yep, exactly. Like, however, you don't have to have sex with someone in order to get AIDS. All you have to do is walk within 16 of them for 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, yep, like, yep. That, that, that's an important insight. That's that's a good way of framing it. Yeah, it's it's not something that people are very smart about because the problem with herd immunity is that when you allow the disease to go forward, then the medical system gets overwhelmed, and the medical that then the death rate shoots up from 0.5 to one percent to five to ten percent. 
That's huge. That's an order of magnitude difference, 10 times as much, you know, a thousand percent increase in death rates if you're trying to get to herd immunity. That, so you, you'd have a thousand percent more deaths when you try to get a herd immunity rather than if you just you know, do various suppression tactics. Anyway, separate, uh, related by topic, but anyway, talking so, to business so leaders. Yes. Moderate worst case scenario for right. basically tie it to what you think vaccine development is because then once there is yes. a vaccine, work, then we're kind of out of the woods. Um, exactly. But until then, you, you, until then, your base case is that restrictions are going to lift, cases are going to pop, restrictions are going to come back on, and we're going to be looking at some sort of... Um, Wave-like patterns. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and, and so that's what I talk about... Yeah, that's what I talk about in my book, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal, the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. And so what you want to do is play out those scenarios, those three scenarios for your business and your career, what you're doing, your role for the next five years, because that's realistically the farthest time horizon when we can realistically plan for. So five years out with the optimistic scenario, the moderate scenario, and the pessimistic scenario. And then what kind of problems might arise for you in each of these scenarios? The optimistic one, the moderate one, and the pessimistic one. And how can you resolve these problems in advance? Some of these problems you can address right now. So for example, in the moderate scenario, if you think that, hey, by or by, it will be over by 2024, let's say that, then what would, be the problems for you with these waves of restrictions. Well, you'll probably have, let's say, uh, I mean, a number of my manufacturing clients, they'll have a lot of supply chain disruptions because this will be, you know, US global, there'll be a lot of supply chain disruptions. So how do you manage your supply chain disruptions is a major issue, that's one. Second, in any of those cases, you know, all of those cases, the optimistic, the moderate, the pessimistic, you should probably switch at least your office workers. If you, let's say, you're, if you're a manufacturer, you should at least switch your office workers to virtual teams. You should not be maintaining your office space. That's a very dangerous space to maintain. You don't really need it. People can work effectively from home. So you want to switch to virtual teams and think about all the pro challenges and problems that are associated with that and how to address them in advance, even in the most optimistic scenario. Then other problems, they can talk about that kind of get it, how are you going to deal with investments, capital, so on. So the, those are the problems. You want to think about problems for each scenario and how can you address these problems in advance. And then what are the opportunities for each scenario and how can you seize these opportunities? For example, you, you can bet that most of your uh, competitors will not be planning for the long term and they will be stumbling as the ne next wave of restrictions comes in. So then perhaps you can approach their clients and say, hey, I've taken steps A, B, C, X, Y, D, Z to be pandemic proof. So if my competitor stumbles, I'm happy to provide you with the service products that they would have provided you. And that way, the, the potential client, the prospect can think of you when in the moment when your competitor stumbles and then you can seize market share. So these are the kinds of opportunities you want to be thinking about going forward. And uh, then how many resources would be needed to seize to solve the problems and seize the opportunities. So resources, reserve those resources and plan for at least the moderate scenario. Don't plan for the optimistic scenario. Hope for the best, but plan for the worst, right? If you can plan, if you have the resources to plan for the pessimistic scenario, that's ideal, but at least plan for the moderate scenario. And then go forward and figure out what kind of information would indicate to you which of these futures you're actually heading toward. And then use that information to pivot and shift your course going forward. So that's the kind of things that you need to do to address the decision-making errors the gut reactions that come from how our brain is wired. So one thing I want to, I guess I got, I got a couple follow on questions sure. uh, for there. Um, what are you seeing? Uh, what, what data have you seen about productivity of office workers? Um, you know, what's the shift? Have you seen any interesting data sets around productivity measures increasing uh, with virtual teams? 
So what you want to do when the virtual teams, I've done this before, I've, I, before the pandemic, I've worked on transitioning some, play, some companies to either hybrid or all virtual teams. And I've done quite a bit of research on this topic. So there are a number of areas that you want to address in order to prevent productivity decreases and even have productivity increases. Specifically six areas you want to be looking at. So six areas if you don't want a productivity decrease, if you want an increase. First, motivation and engagement. Motivation engagement, already before the pandemic, we know that on average around 34% of all employees are engaged, actively engaged with the company, meaning they're creative, they're ready to sacrifice for the company, they're solving problems, taking initiatives, taking leadership from anywhere in the organization. Most people, over 50%, something like 55% are somewhat disengaged. They're just coming in, punching the clock, doing the minimum they can to get by, not get fired, ready to leave if a better opportunity presents itself. And something like 15% are hostile, actively hostile, where they're looking for to leave and bad-mouthing the company, so subverting the company from within. The problem when people go work from home, especially when they're kind of forced to work from home, is that there is more disengagement because well, in the first few weeks, they're still kind of rallying around the flag, around the company. But as they spend more time at home, we are tribal creatures. So kind of going back to the evolutionary psychology, what's going on with our decision making. We are very much influenced by people who are in our surroundings. And when we're not surrounded by coworkers who are working, it's hard for us to stay engaged, to stay motivated. This is a big challenge, especially right now with the pandemic, when kids are staying home, you know, teenagers are coming from college to stay home, when you have to take care of older adults, there's a lot of tensions, you know, get groceries, right, get toilet paper. So you have to figure out how to help your employees stay engaged and motivated. And there are a number of tools to do so. But if you, you, that's a problem you need to solve. You need to be aware each company has to solve it in its own way. So that's one problem, one area. Then another area is effective communication. Now, it's already hard to communicate effectively face-to-face, -face, of course. <laughs> it becomes much harder when you transition to virtual without, if you don't provide people with training. Because virtual collaboration takes place overwhelmingly through text, through Slack, through Microsoft Teams, through Trello, through Asana, whatever collaboration software you're using. And when you're using text, you lose a lot of the subtext. You Things like tone of voice, things like body language. You don't see when somebody has an anxious expression, a worried, a concerned, an excited expression on their face, which is very important, body language. You don't hear when somebody, the tone of somebody expressing things. When I say something like, I think Mary should take that project, or I say, I think Mary you should take that project those two sentences mean very different things but when you write them down they're the same thing if people right, aren't your, your four emojis in business communication pardon can you repeat that please your, your four emojis in business <laughs> i am for emojis yes but of course it's going to be kind of you know people are have difficulty with emojis as well and they are not thinking about <laughs> using emojis they're not thinking about using emojis you know when they're effectively communicating in business so this is a problem right you need to train people in how to have effective virtual communication and many people don't think about that when they're transitioning to virtual teams a related but not the same issue is problem solving conflicts when you're in the office environment it's pretty easy or much easier at least to solve problems because you can notice problems earlier onward you can stop somebody in the hallway chat to them about hey what's going on with this project and you see their worry anxiety tensions resolve problems in the moment address them it's much easier to do so when you're in a virtual team it's harder to notice problems in the first place because you don't know that they're happening you're not engaging with people on this everyday level so that's one noticing problems and then because of the communication difficulties it's harder to resolve problems even if you're do video doing video conference to resolve problems you're still seeing each other on a small screen so it's harder to have that humanized element that contact and to communicate effectively around problems so that's a third area resolving problems that's another area of professional development you can definitely be trained for that so fourth area cultivating trust 
In the office environment, cultivating trust comes naturally, comes easily. You connect with people, you have that engagement, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, meet over the water cooler over lunch, talk about your kids, your vacation plans, whatever is happening, you know, local sports, the ball team, right? I'm in Columbus, Ohio, go Bucks, and, and so on. So that is the kind of connection you can have, the cultivation, the trust, the human relationship. It's much harder to do that when you're in a virtual setting if you don't provide venues for doing that. And there are a number of ways that you can address that. You can provide that humanizing element, that connection, but you have to deliberately do it and you have to take steps to do it. We could talk about that. So that's the fourth yeah, one. We actually, oh. we had to do, we did a, um, we, we try to do virtual happy hour every week. We used to have happy hour starting at four o'clock on Thursdays here. So next time you're in Iowa, yeah. there's no pandemic in seven years, apparently. And so they have a vaccine, uh, you know, swing happy by time. at four o'clock on Thursday for a happy hour. Otherwise, we can invite you in on our Zoom meeting, but it's a little less fun. But uh, people are now take playing games and <laughs> yeah. stuff. So we're we, we also did a uh, mm -hmm. a uh, we did like a quarterly state of grace thing. So we we actually the only company we could get to like deliver to all of our employees was, was um, Panera. So we, so we had to <laughs> deliver to all of our employees. Okay. We all sat down like virtually That's together, cool. and so we we mm -hmm. do try to. So if you if, That's if, good. if there's folks listening who are looking at ways mm -hmm. to do that. That's a few things that we've tried and I, I think it's working, I, but Excellent. it's super important. I think. Yeah, so those the social hour, happy hours, that's good. There are more things that you do on an everyday level to replace the water cooler conversation. So what I do with clients who I transition, to, this is what I'm working on with a number of clients right now, and I did before, is to have two things or two types of things that you can set up. One is a policy where every day when they start their work day, they start their work day and we have um, a channel for their team and the team is a supervisor and let's say eight people. So a Slack channel where what they do is they start the work day by sharing how they're feeling, what they're doing, what's going on in their life recently that they want to share about, what is one thing about them that most of the rest of the team doesn't know, fun fact, and what they're planning to work on that day. That's and then they, respond, then they respond to at least three other people who share the same thing that day. So what does that have? That creates a human connection, that, uh, the thing that you would chat about over the water cooler, right? Uh, at lunch, when you check in with people, what's going on? You humanize each other, you create that connection, you remind each other that you're human beings, and you also connect with others about what they're doing, so their lives. So that's kind of one sort of a policy thing, a morning check-in. And that's obligatory. And then there's a separate channel where it's just people just chat about throughout the day about what's up, anything that's non work related, anything, you know, local sports ball team, like I said, scores, vacation plans, kids, anything they want to share. Interesting there's article no they read. There's no, there's no sports news anymore. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing <zero. laughs> sure, but more, uh, um, I think, more sharing like, oh, when is this league reopening or that thing reopening? I think <laughs> some stuff like that. But yeah, basically those, those sorts of things, everyday life stuff, recipes from the quarantine. <laughs> so those sorts of things. So you have that combination of an obligatory daily check-in that everyone has to do and then spontaneous autonomous anyone can do whatever and that I, we fi I find uh, provides a good balance for people so people who are more yeah. extrovert will do the you know both things and extensively chat uh, throughout the day people who are introverted will just do the morning thing and that's great and that's good for both personalities how about the what's your we do 15 minute stand up meetings i guess we're not standing up anymore but we call them stand ups <laughs> um you know uh uh what i mean any research or you know how have you found those have you found those to be effective my my concern is that potentially it takes up a little too it's not just 15 minutes anymore like but we do try to get some of that water cool conversation i don't know, just want to hear your thoughts on the stand up it tends to those tend to people tend to uh, be distracted during those and be checking their phones <laughs> and stuff like that, that they tend to be disengaged. Whereas you know, if you're doing it, the important thing is to do it as in a textual format. So that's kind of important because people are virtually used to communicating in a textual format. So you want to humanize each other in a textual format. So when they're 
communicating on Slack about work things, they're now also remembering, oh, this is a human being whose you know, baby was crying the other day because they wasn't able to get the usual you know, milk bottle or whatever recipe because the milk was out at the grocery store. You know, <laughs> those sorts of things. So that's the, a more effective way than just kind of those stand-up meetings. The social happy hours work well, but that's kind of an after work sort of thing. No, I think I think that's a great point. Was there a, was there a six point or tr trust was yes, five? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, that that was four. So two more areas. Four. Another area is internal controls. So you want to look at internal controls. A lot of people who are they just use their of course when they're switching over to virtual they're using their business continuity plans their business continuity disaster preparedness and i'm someone as a disaster avoidance expert i've prepared a lot of these plans so i know how they're structured they're structured for a week long maybe two week interruption that's great if it's a blizzard or a situation like Houston getting flooded. That's excellent, but they're not great for a situation where Houston got flooded and then stayed flooded. That's not what a business continuity plan is for. So you have to think about other aspects that are important to bring up right now, like internal controls. And that's issues like financial security. So you want to make sure to protect your financial security. Issues like cybersecurity. So people who are for working from home, they are, not used to following cybersecurity protocols when they're working from home. And the FBI has found that already there's a great, great increase in the number of hacking, successful hacking efforts and successful hacking because people are working from home. They're not following typical cybersecurity protocols. Also, their computers aren't hardened in the way that they would be in the office. So that's another thing to think about providing them with funding, so training on cybersecurity and funding on having hardened computers. Another area is a compliance protocol. So a lot of compliance protocols are optimized for the office, but there's other implications, compliance implications, depending on the industry that you're in that are involved with being working from home. So that's another thing to think about as part of internal controls. Finally, you want to think about your measurements. In the office, the measurements of effectiveness and efficiency are going to be different than the ones that are going to be going on at home. So you want to think about changing measures of effectiveness and efficiency to adapt them to this new norm of working from home. So that, that's a fifth area. And finally, the last area is accountability. In the office, accountability is much easier to achieve because when you're a supervisor, you can just walk about the office or the factory floor, see who what, who's doing what, see that sort of connection. And so check in with people, see if someone's anxious, disengaged, whatever, frustrated, and talk to them, right? That's a accountability. Then you also have peer-to-peer -peer accountability. You can pop into Bob's office and say, hey, Bob, where's that report you were promised me to deliver me earlier, right? It's pretty hard to ignore someone standing in your office door, but it's much harder to ignore someone who just sent you a Slack message. So there, to address both of those areas of accountability, you want to provide a new venue, a reporting structure of some sort that addresses both chain of command accountability and peer-to-peer -peer accountability. So that's the sixth area, peer-to-peer -peer accountability and chain of command accountability. If you take care of those six areas, Mm -hmm. sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. go ahead and elaborate elaborate a little bit on um, the um, especially the peer-to-peer -peer accountability what systems are you seeing or how, how are you I mean is it slack is it we I don't know I, that one I, I yeah, any system sure any system that you use has a way where you can make a public report and so what a uh, overwhelmingly I do with companies that transition is have a weekly report where someone shares publicly the kind of things they've done over that week. And that's the chain of command accountability. So what you've done, the numerical outcomes, because it's much harder to measure when it's, you need other measurements when you're working at home. So the numerical outcomes, specific data, whatever you can provide. So it's a, it's a report, it's maybe something like, 500 words or so of uh, what you're doing, what's going on. And that helps replace the weekly meeting if you have a weekly meeting or in complement to a weekly meeting, depending on the structure. But anyway, so having a report, that's great. And then in as part of the report, you tag peers and say, hey, here's how Bob has helped me with the report. Or, you know, Mary is a little bit delayed with the, with the, the accountability, with the, the documents she was supposed to send me or whatever. So you tag people with whom you've been collaborating. 
And because you have the same supervisor, that provides peer-to-peer -peer accountability, where you're saying who's been helpful, who can improve over that week. And uh, so that's that, yeah, that's really good. Excellent. So yeah, that sort of reporting structure is really helpful for you as a supervisor to be able to see what's going on in the team, who's doing what, both their own productivity and how they're helping other team members or not helping other team members. Right. That, that's really good. Um, I, I, I couldn't help, but I, I, I want to skip back just a little bit. Sure. Um, I, you know, you, you said the term, uh, let's say pandemic proof. Yes. And I, I don't know if Amazon is one of your clients. If you can't talk about it, I, I understand. But um, it seemed to me like Jeff Bezos made a massive move recently to spend three. You know, he basically is telling the stock market he's going to be spending all of the profits over the next Mm -hmm. however many quarters to basically pandemic proof his supply chain. I mean, it, this seems to me to be one of the most massive moves in, in, in maybe the history of business. I mean, mm -hmm. it, if, if he is listening to you or people like you, and then that stock is going to take off um, and more than it already has. And mm -hmm. these retailers are going to be crushed because I don't think yes. anyone is thinking like he is. I, mm -hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Bezos is really smart. I mean, I saw a, what was about a year ago when he had a meeting with a number of, and I'm not working with Amazon, just to be clear. He had a meeting with a number of employees, an internal meeting where he said, you know, Amazon, no matter how big we are, will fail eventually because companies fail. You know, the average time rate of a company, successful company in the Fortune 500 is something like 30 years. And he, what he said is that Amazon will fail. The only thing we can do is take whatever steps we can to delay failure into the future. So I think that was very smart. It's kind of a very wise approach and that's what he's doing. And he's pretty vigilant in looking at the future in addressing problems. So I talked about problems, right? How do you address problems and seize opportunities? I think his move combines those. It's addressing problems and seizing opportunities. If he can come and tell you that, hey, we are pandemic proof, you can rely on us in a way that other large retailers like Walmart, Target, and so on, they can't tell you that. <laughs> They're not going, you know, and he can not simply tell you that, but he can show you that, you know, show me the money, right? <laughs> He's showing you with his money that he is not giving this money back to investors like the airlines did, <laughs> that he is really very smartly, and he's an investor. I mean, he owns 11% of Amazon, right? If he chose to give that money back, he'd make quite a bit of profit, but he's not. He's making for, his own, for himself. He instead is making a bet on the long-term future of the company and smartly realizing that the pandemic will be around much longer than the stock market than many people believe and the impact will be much longer. So he's working on getting pandemic proof and whoever you know listening to this podcast you need to take that example this is you know what i'm telling my clients you want to be able to show your clients and your prospects and other external stakeholders people everyone ranging from regulators to you know, government officials to investors bankers you know whoever's giving you more money you want to show them the steps that you're taking to be pandemic proof in the long term that will of course decrease your rate of borrowing because then you'll be able to get money at a cheaper rate and people will be more willing to work with you because they can be more confident about what's going on with you compared to many others who are not taking the pandemic nearly as seriously. I mean, by comparison, look at Elon Musk pressing to get the Tesla factories open in California. Not only is that bad press, but really he, it's clear that he's not taking the kind of precautions that are really needed to address the pandemic going forward. So that's did, not very did, smart. Did you see Tesla's actual plan? Did, did, did he posted it online. Were you, did, did you check it out? I checked out. I don't have the expertise to check out the pl to check out the plan and really carefully evaluate how good it is. So I'm reading evaluations of experts on the plan. So epidemiologists, healthcare experts who are just pretty concerned with how aggressive Tesla is being in opening up and the plan that is not sufficiently thought out in addressing a lot of health concerns. Um, another thing is when I'm, when I'm listening to you talk, I just feel like I, I mean, how much of Nassim Nicholas Taleb's work did you kind of, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, how, how much, how much, I mean, did that get, was that like one of your 
early influences when you were thinking about this work or how, how much have you kind of relied on some of his his work is complementary to my own. So what uh, he is, he's also works in this field, right? Kind of he's, he's a, a colleague, essentially, who works on a spe the specific area of, on, of a unpredicted, hard to predict events. So black swan events, high impact, unpredictable, or unlikely events. That's something that he works on. The pandemic was not quite that. So it's not quite a black swan because a lot of people have been warning us about it. So in Caleb's terms, this would be a gray swan. This would be something that's low likelihood, low probability, but very much predictable. Something, you know, an asteroid hitting the earth, <laughs> that's kind of unpredictable. Or a major earthquake without any sort of information about it. Earthquakes are notoriously hard to predict. Those are more black swan event you know a, a big the big one hitting california <laughs> that's kind of would be more of a black swan event but this is not quite that because the pandemic it was already developing in december it was pretty clear in december that if it's impacting wuhan now a lot of people really underestimated the kind of problems that are happening in wuhan china which is the origin of, of the pandemic they think, oh, hey, this is a, I've never heard of this city. It's probably some kind of backwards China city. <laughs> this is a lot, what a lot of people perceive about Just Wuhan. Full disclosure, I had surgery in Wuhan as an undergrad. Whoa, okay. <laughs> so clearly not you. So you, yeah, you, I you, you like I lived in I lived in Hong Kong, so I just Okay, so so you so you know that Wuhan is a huge city. It's eleven million people. It produces something like over twenty two billion in revenue per year, and it's called the Chicago of China. So it's kind of a major industrial and travel hub. It has something like uh, 250 international flights per day. So that's a huge amount of people who are traveling uh, out of that uh, out of that city. So that the, so depending on you know something like maybe 10,000 people per day traveling in and out every day out of Wuhan. So obviously it's going to spread the pandemic quite globally, internationally. It's not something that can be easily contained. And it was already clear that this was going to be a serious issue in December 2019. But people in the US did not wake up until, what, March, early March uh, to this issue? When was the emergency declared in the US? You know, mid-March, really. And uh, the, already, I mean, by comparison, what was happening in Italy, even, even not going into Wuhan, I mean, obviously people got that wrong. But looking at Italy in mid-February, stuff was getting real there. You know, things were getting really bad. And still, nothing was happening in the US. No one was preparing. No one except you know, Bill Gates and some other people who are actually looking at the situation carefully and thoughtfully were saying that this is a real issue. This is a real problem. Now, the what I deal with is called cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are the specific dangerous judgment errors we make because of how our brain is wired. And there's a big one that relates to Wuhan, first of all. Wuhan is, there's a cognitive bias called attentional bias, where we look at, uh, where we look and care about things that are emotionally salient to us in the environment whether it's a saber-toothed tiger, so <laughs> threats, something that's emotionally salient, when that's what we care about. We don't intuitively care about Wuhan, China, because it doesn't feel salient. It's like, oh, who cares, right? I mean, to you, Drew, it feels salient because you had surgery there, but most of us didn't. So most of us, unless we take the time to address our gut reactions, don't feel that it's salient. By contrast, a lot of people in from China, Asian people here in the US and around the world were aware of the problems in Wuhan. So for example, you can see that in a number of Italian cities that had large Chinese populations, they took steps early onward, much before the rest of Italy, to isolate themselves, to protect themselves, and to protect others from themselves, to quarantine themselves. And then, so with cities where you had a high Chinese population, had a much lower case rate and death rate. And that's an example of where people to whom Wuhan was salient, they took the steps that were necessary. And unfortunately, the rest of us didn't. You know, in the US, we only started taking steps when New York was becoming a serious <laughs> health crisis. And that's well, I, obviously I mean, you know, this, this no masks thing that 
was floating around. Anyone who has traveled internationally or who has lived in Asia knows people wear masks like all the time. I mean, ever <laughs> since SARS one, that you know, this this was like a, this is like a normal everyday occurrence. Yeah. And you know, and you know, the Sim Nicholas to love was like you need to be wearing masks. And every you know, and and the the WHO as well as the CDC were saying no. And like they're just, I, I, I'm actually I'm pretty curious about what the hell do you think happened with the mm. CDC as, as well as the WHO? I, I just... I, it's I, hard I, to I say. I mean, understand. yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty ridiculous. I agree with you, Drew. They might have been trying to protect the supply of masks because it was so short and make sure that medical personnel got them. That might have been what they were thinking about. But really, it's not good information. I mean... Or, it, I, it, I, it, I, I mean, let's broaden the conversation past even the mass thing. What happened in their response? I mean, the WHO, what do they do? Fall asleep at the wheel when yeah. this was happening in China? I, I just do not get... I, I yeah, do not I, don't I don't understand it either. I think that they were probably misled by the Chinese authorities. That's the only real, you know, realistic explanation that I can see. The Chinese authorities provided bad numbers. And if you look, remember... The U.S. response, the CDC's response, you know, the U.S. political authorities, they initially praised Chinese response. They said, that, you know, China was doing a good job and so on. I mean, you look at the U.S. response in January. Then after that, they switched over to blaming China starting in February, March, when it, uh, especially in March, when stuff started getting real in the U.S. So I think it's just probably a matter of the kind of information that was released from China and both the WHO and the CDC being initially too credible to, be to believing China too much that it was providing the right information. So that's what I'm guessing happened. I mean, obviously, I don't know what's internally was what was going on. So, let, OK, I mean, obviously, there was an actual pandemic plan. So I, yes. I think I think I think I, let's be clear. So there was a plan developed. Just no one actually thought it was time to pull the lever, right? Like uh, that's not they quite the case. The so, late, late. Yes, they pulled the lever. There were a number of people in the U.S. government who already, if you look at the internal documentation, their communication, they were already saying in early February that hey, it's time to pull the lever. So health experts were saying that. By and a number of people who are in political of positions of political authority, political appointees, basically not government health experts who were serving in the government for their whole career, not those people. The people who are political appointees were saying, no, it's going to hurt the economy too much for us to pull the lever. And so they waited f until there were very, very clear and obvious you know, people were in refrigerated trucks in New York, bodies full of uh, trucks full of refrigerated bodies in New York. Basically, they waited until that time to pull the lever when it got really bad. By contrast, look at what happened in South Korea. They pulled the lever. They found the first case of COVID-19 in South Korea, literally on the same day that the U.S. found the first case of South Korea. And South Korea is, you know, it has 60 million people compared to 330 million people in the US. But South Korea pulled the lever early and they were able to get control of their pandemic really effectively so that only 250 people died and they didn't, and they had they did not have any shutdowns. They just implemented moderate social distancing, moderate restrictions, social distancing measures, contact tracing, isolation, and testing. That's what South Korea did. And they only had 250 people die, and their economy didn't suffer nearly as badly as the US. So if the US did that, which we certainly were capable of doing when the pandemic was in its very early stages, if we had paid sufficient attention to what was happening in Wuhan and taken the situation as seriously as the South Koreans, there's no reason that and followed our own pandemic plan that was developed and available for a long time, then we would be in that same place as South Korea. Maybe, you know, 250 people died there. So maybe by comparison, something like, you know, 1500 would have died here, as opposed to the 80,000 plus that already died, clearly more on the way and all these shutdowns, all these restrictions. So how are you how are you personally convincing CEOs to pull the lever? OK, so there's there's what we've talked about is you've put this plan in place. I, know I would assume part of that plan is actually automate the lever pulling. <laughs> you know, That'd I mean, be nice. Yeah. I mean, so when these metrics hit, you, you know, just immediately crescendo. 
Um, but beyond that, I mean, obviously, uh, convincing it seemed it seemed like it, it, it in the government condition. Um, convincing the leaders to take the action to pull the le lever was problematic. So let's talk about it in business. How are we, you know, how are you convincing CEOs, other leaders, risk management people, hey, it's time to pull the lever, um, especially when it's going to cost money, right? It's, 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 it's actually not that, it's not that hard because the, what you do is you sit down with them and you say, let's look at the reality of the situation. How much money will it cost you to not pull the lever versus pull the lever? We all suffer from a cognitive bias. I talked about decision making errors. We suffer from two more cognitive biases that I want to highlight here that are really important. One is the normalcy bias. Normalcy bias is where we assume that the future will be normal. The future will look the same as it did in the past. The next few years will look like this, like we did in the past few years. In the Savannah environment, that was a safe assumption. So we shouldn't, <laughs> that was good for the Savannah environment, very bad for their mother environment, because we have so much more disruption going on, whether the fiscal crisis of 2008, 2009, whether a whole bunch of technology disruptions or whether the pandemic. So I would talk to them about, hey, what would you have wished you did differently in 2008, 2009? What happened there? How much did it impact you? And then how can you take more effective steps right now, keeping in mind that the pandemic will be worse? The concept of the consequences of the pandemic will be unquestionably worse than 2008, 2009. We already know it's, it, it's already worse in many ways. Unemployment is lower, the hit to the economy is greater, and the consequences, the, how much more of a debt do we have right now? that uh, you know, the bailout in 2008, 2009 cost something like 800 billion. Right now, we already have something like over two, two trillion just in, over two trillion just in bailout money spent on the US economy and certainly more coming into the future. So this is definitely going to be a bigger hit. There will be more restrictions, waiver of restrictions. What can you do right now? Let's do the math and sit down and look at what's going to happen and address the other cognitive bias that's relevant here that I mentioned. It's called hyperbolic discounting. We tend to be very short term oriented. That was great for the Savannah environment because in the Savannah environment, it was not a wise idea for us to plan for the long term. You know, if we kill the mammoth, we couldn't preserve the meat, right? That was not something that we should orient toward. In the modern environment, of course, we can plan our business for the long term, we can put our money in the bank, we can plan for our career in the long term. That's much more safe, but it doesn't feel very relevant. The long term doesn't feel very relevant. So what you do is you make the long term relevant. And I talk about that five year range. Where do you want to be in five years from now, considering the reality of the situation? And let's plan out from that five year range going to today. What steps can you take right now to be where you want to be in five years? Invariably, that means switching to virtual teams. Obviously, if they have a factory, then not switching the factory because they still need to produce stuff to virtual teams, but switching their office workers to as much virtual as possible, doing a lot of social distancing in the factory. So that's a lot of stuff that they need to be that they're working on and that we're working on. What's effective social distancing going beyond CDC guidelines, aiming for 10 feet instead of six feet because that's safer and a lot of other new kind of evaluating the research on these topics. What can we do effectively to make the environment as safe as possible for their workers to feel safe? Because you want your workers to be committed to you. You want them to feel like you're taking care of them and not like what Tesla is doing, which is forcing people to go into unsafe working conditions, essentially. That certainly breeds disloyalty and dismotivation, not something you want. So you want people, your people to feel loyal to you and to feel it you're taking care of them well. So orienting toward that long term. That means a lot of changes in CEOs once we sit down and we look at the simple math, the simple numbers, it becomes very clear, very obvious that these are major pivots that they need to do right now for the sake of their long term success. What, what do you assess the risk of massive kind of inflation as? And, you know, so do you have you worked on any inflation plans? Uh, like kind of, I mean, it seems to me like maybe that's a risk we're not talking about is that, you know, there's going to be something like, I think probably all said and done, potentially we're at like 6 billion or sorry, 6 trillion in additional debt after this. Yes. Um, so 2 trillion in direct surplus, 
4 trillion in buying corporate bonds that might be money that we don't you know that we end up getting back so because it depends on how safe the bonds are they we're buying investment grade bonds so that's kind of the fed is buying investment grade bonds so hopefully that's safe enough and hopefully we'll get that money back but 2 trillion is money that we're not getting back it's direct you know money to the the taxpayers and so on right i mean but, so but and that's, and that's without additional rounds. The one that they're talking about now is an additional three billion yes. uh, that they passed, or actually they passed on Friday. I mean, yeah, so and that we will see what happens with uh, whether that gets through Senate and the White House. I don't know. Who knows? But it, it seems to me, what, have, I mean, are people, are, are business leaders properly looking at inflation? Um, I'm not sure how much inflation risk there is because the Fed is going to be very carefully looking at preventing inflation risk, and they do have a number of instruments for that. That's one. Second, given the number of job losses that that we have suffered, I'm not sure inflation is going to be that much of a concern. Inflation is a concern when we have a pretty active full economy. So that's the balance between unemployment and inflation. And so that's right now un unemployment is going so high that inflation doesn't seem Seem likely to be a concern, at least in the medium term. We Maybe actually deflation is more of the risk. If, 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 if you're about deflation, I think, is actually a risk. Yes, deflation is a risk, and that depends on what's going to happen in the future. So that's definitely something to consider. I'm not sure what will happen, but that's kind of a matter of pivoting. That's definitely something that you want to be looking at, especially in the moderate and pessimistic scenarios, if it does last longer than the two year optimistic timeline. <laughs> oh, but what are what in kind of the last minute or two that we have left, what additional what are some risks that we you know, obviously the pandemic is this big one that's really shiny and everyone's trying to pay attention to. What are some other risks that you think are potentially out there that people are underprepared for? Well, they are looking at the pandemic. They're not looking nearly enough at the economic hit of the pandemic, the recession that's going on. That's not something that they're thinking about nearly as much as they should be because they're looking only at their health consequences. But the recession is going to be huge. It's more likely to be a depression. It depends on what you define as a depression, but it's going to be a major, major recession, worse than the 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis. No question about it. And that is a company. So you want to be thinking about a number of areas that are going to be happening that people are really aren't thinking about. I mean, one of the biggest areas that I think about is that your external stakeholders are going to be much more disrupted than you think they will be, especially because most of them are not going to be prepared for the pandemic. I mean, what do you think will happen to, let's say, banks? Banks are going to take a huge hit. So there will be a huge number of defaults, much more than they think they will be, there will be, because the pandemic will be still ongoing. There will be waves of restrictions and loosenings. That means that if the banks are going to be in a bad place, that means that your moderate to long term money supply is likely to be in a bad place. So that's something that people want to be thinking about. What's going to happen with the with the money that you can borrow. That, that's going to be tough. That's another thing is investors. So if you have investors, especially if you're in the earlier in the startup mode, they're going to have less money to invest in you. So what's going to be happening in that scenario? The supply chains, I kind of mentioned that briefly, but the supply chains is going to be a major issue. The pandemic will be disrupting supply chains going forward because you know they're discovering new cases in China, for example, right now. When they're and this is part of being this is part of what's happening in all countries that have initially controlled the pandemic and are now loosening restrictions. Cases are increasing. There's going to be China has a num I think something like 60 million people under lockdown right now. So that's pretty huge. And of course, the suppliers, the, the, the factories that are producing raw goods and shipping them to the US to manufacture here are hit by this. So you want to be thinking about your supply chains, what's going to happen there, and your service providers. A number of them will not be able to effectively provide services during the pandemic. So those are the things that you want to be thinking about. So you want to be th essentially thinking about all of your external stakeholders envision that they're not going to be nearly as prepared as you will, that they will not be pandemic proof. And what steps will you take to protect yourself against the failures of your external stakeholders due to the economic consequences of the pandemic? So that's something that I think a lot of people aren't thinking about. So do planes ever get safe? It, <laughs> I mean, do you, do you think it, I mean, is it, is there just any way to make them safe? 
to make planes to make planes safe to, to reduce the risk in planes uh, to, for air travel yeah. it's going to be very hard because it's not something about masks it's it's being in a small tight space and we know that being in a small tight one of the biggest problems with people going back to the office is that regardless of whether you wear masks if you spend a long time in a small enclosed space people's breath including those who have COVID-19 circulates around that space fully so that's one of the biggest problems with air travel that people's breath circulates throughout the cabin and it's very easy when you're you know try, when you're going from New York to Los Angeles that's six hours and I've been on that flight a number of times that's something where you essentially get everyone's breath in your face eventually so that's not something that is a safe environment to be in and that's one of the reasons why office workers that that's not a safe environment to be in either because you you're sitting in an enclosed space from nine to five you know so not great either so that's a, that's something that's why I'm recommending that people switch to virtual teams and for for travel i strongly encourage people to take the car whenever possible do video conference i mean especially if you're in a vulnerable category you really don't want to plane travel right now well thank you so much is there anything you'd like to ask the listeners besides go and get your book now <laughs> <laughs> because this is not over it's going to continue uh but anything else that you would like you like to ask uh, ask the listeners well, listeners can check out my resources more broadly at disasteravoidanceexperts.com for especially go to disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe for a free assessment on these cognitive biases, these dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe. I strongly encourage you to take that. That's essentially a needs analysis. It will show you what's needed and what steps you can take yourself using your resources to address these dangerous judgment errors. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I, I, I hope we are all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too, but I wouldn't bet on it. I'd be happy to take, you know, 10 to one bet that I'm not wrong. And, you know, it's just unfortunate, but it's the reality of the situation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Drew. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Find us on whichever podcast app you use. Thank you for listening. I'm Drew Allen. We look forward to seeing you in the next episode.